I suggest that we have it all today. There's a huge number of us women who've got those rights, we implement those rights, we welcome and we cherish those rights. The other side of the fence, there are even more women than us who don't have those rights. They didn't have any opportunity to have them. Indeed, they have much, much less than those rights. They are the victims of today. I, I start by offering my very profound thanks to the presidential precinct. We're being given a wonderful opportunity altogether to focus on hugely important matters that affect our world today. I particularly want to thank Jim Murray, whose brilliant vision of the need today to reinforce the impulse of the common good is the thread that has brought us together and to enshrine in all societies the fundamentals which ensure that the common good embraces our way of dealing with each other. We look for global guidance, of course, in the great UN conventions, these vital documents signed and mostly ratified by each nation's leaders and their governments, are frequently not honoured and most likely never referred to below the levels of the lawmakers and the judiciaries. The lives of ordinary people need much, much more. And it's clear that women do particularly, given the unbearable suffering that millions, no billions of our fellow women endure on a daily basis. May I suggest that the post Second World War system is not protecting them, <coughs> nor given the weak level of salary equalization internationally, is the world seemingly keen to give women the professional and the economic status that would allow women to become fully equal without any more lobbying. I personally believe that real freedom is economic freedom. We need much, much more action for and by women to gain globally assured equality and the thoughtful, high-powered, yet profoundly practical leadership <coughs> that the presidential precinct pioneers will result, and I have no doubts in this at all, in closing the magic circle of the aspirations that we all have, of the grand ideas that we debate so eloquently, and bring at last the final achievement of the fundamental freedoms for all and sundry. What are those fundamental freedoms? We know them well. The freedom to move, the freedom to worship, the freedom to speak, the freedom to trade, the freedom to have our own intellectual property, the freedom to cross borders, the freedom to be ourselves, the freedom to have our own identity and to be respected whoever and whatever we are and for wherever we come from. Now, how does the Magna Carta give us the trigger for freedom of women since it was drafted, written, and signed by the all-powerful of 13th century England, who were naturally all men. Now, we women are certainly identified in the Great Charter, but by default. Sadly, not as individuals in our own right, because we had no legal status at that time at all. We had no identity. But on our acceptable positions as wives, as mothers, and most importantly as guardians of our late husband's honour and sometimes property, and in those positions we were identified, and those rights accruing to us by virtue of our fathers, our brothers and our husbands were codified in the context of widowhood, motherhood and wifedom. But not for all women, just for a few, the noble women. I, fortunate as I am, would be protected by the Charter. No other woman in my village of Winterbourne would have been protected, save my sisters, by accident of birth. Yet, from this highly unprepossessing start, the rights of every woman and every girl throughout the United Kingdom and beyond have become protected in law, implemented by most judiciaries and by the police in many societies, 
and most importantly of all, accepted and honoured by global people internationally. Now the argument is why rights are not being fulfilled. It is not an argument that those rights should be enshrined. This curious document, the Magna Carta, began, I suggest, much of that. Why could that happen in Britain, which has had powerful women, as most societies have throughout the ages? How could those women have flourished without identity? How is it that the Magna Carta triggered something that made women's rights come out? I suggest that there was a very inherent belief in British society that women were equal to men. Indeed, the very first woman, historically speaking, known to everyone, Queen Boadicea, she led from the front and died because of it. But as Julius Caesar noted disapprovingly, women in Britain had the same rights as men in law at the time of the Roman invasion. He didn't waste much time in getting rid of it, but nonetheless he wrote to his wife or his mother, I can't remember which in his diaries, saying this is a grey and rainy island, don't come here. And they're quite crazy, these people. They treat their women the same as men in law. So I think underneath it all, we still had that belief. Two big invasions, completely but paid to that, the Roman, followed by the Norman invasion. And that left women without their status, save rather quirkily in the city of London. If you look up Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, think for a moment, why did the young men chase city widows? Because they were wealthy. Why were they wealthy? Because they could inherit. They were the only people in the whole of England who could inherit. So penniless young men chased elderly, rich city widows. It shows their status. They had it. They were very fortunate from the beginning. They kept their status. And it's interesting in the Magna Carta that the rights of the city of London are protected, but they're much older than that. And the Magna Carta and its sister document, the Charter of the Forest, reopened the doors of women's freedom to trade. The, 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 the Charter of the Forest, almost behind one of the sentences, you find women's right to pick up wood in the forests without being decapitated. All right, that's not much of a right, but that's exactly <laughs> the same right as the foresters were being given. King John didn't want it to happen, you see, and he clamped down on it, but women in there as well as men, which is rather good. So we're allowed to trade, we're allowed to work. That's absolutely fantastic. One of the key freedoms, freedom to marry, without being forced to do so. Very important when the king had guardianship. Women then, as you know, the right, they, they were the property of their husbands, their fathers, and their brothers. Indeed, you can tell when you read your Jane Austen, that, that was exactly the same. When you read your Shakespeare, when you read The Winter's Tale, the whole weak spot is that the women didn't have any rights at all. They were all begging all the time to get protection, to be allowed to do what they wanted to do. So the Magna Carta, gave quite a lot of rights. It even gave the right to women to speak in law, a ability only when their husbands were killed, not when anyone else was killed, but even that was a tiny fragment of a right. And we women were very, very, very good, as you know, at weaving something very large indeed out of something very, very modest. We've had to do that because of this situation. However, I will say, that a huge number, amount of time had to pass before true women's rights came into the United Kingdom as a whole. 1707, the Union of, the, the, the Union of Parliaments of Scotland and England brought some of the Scottish rights to England and vice versa. The clans allowed women to inherit some of them, not very many. And 700 years or more later, my grandmother campaigned for the right to vote. We found a lovely photograph of her beautifully dressed in black with a veil, with gloves, a slender young lady, standing beside her a huge London policeman, three times her girth, twice her height, looking rather disapprovingly down on her as she stands there holding a banner saying, votes for women. It took a long, long time. But power at last came through. In my four years of work with Mrs. Thatcher when she was Prime Minister, we concentrated, she gave me the job as a voluntary vice chairman of the party, she gave me the job of focusing on the rights of women. She knew how crucial it was to have an equal society. 
Today, women all over the world theoretically have these rights. As I have said, the UN conventions enshrine them all, signed and ratified, incorporated in different legislations, different constitutions everywhere. But they don't have those rights. These conventions are too far away. Corrupted legislation, corrupted judiciaries, the law is only as good as he who writes the law, she who implements it, and those who judge it, and the police. The law is not perfect just because it is the law. So these societies where women don't have their rights, and indeed in the United Kingdom, we have a um, huge, probably the most multicultural city in the globe in London, 150 different nationalities, and that's at a, a rather low count. So we have a task of ensuring that all these common values are brought in and that we all work together for the common good. I'm grateful to the presidential precinct uh, earlier last year, we had a wonderful conference in the Amar Foundation in the presidential precinct and with the universities to form the presidential precinct. And we were focusing particularly on the tragic plight of the Yazidi women who may very well, as uh, the law may yet be able to prove, be victims of real, true, copper bottom plated genocide. I suggest that we have it all today. There's a huge number of us women who've got those rights, we implement those rights, we welcome and we cherish those rights. The other side of the fence, there are even more women than us who don't have those rights. They didn't have any opportunity to have them. Indeed, they have much, much less than those rights. They are the victims of today. I suggest that the magic circle is there. In the room today, we have all the capacity every single scrap of it, ladies and gentlemen, to change that situation globally. We represent almost everywhere. We represent many different societies, many different places. We're all together as a team. Here we are in the presidential precinct. I think we should go for it, work together to close that magic circle and bring the rights of women to every single one. Thank you.